Hello and welcome to the third video in this 2D game tutorial series. In this video we'll be talking about how shaders really work, a little more on the graphics pipeline and how the vertex data that we input into a VBO actually makes it to the screen. We'll also tidy up our project a little and move the shader loading and initializing into its own class. Let's start off by talking about shaders and what they are. I quickly mentioned last time that shaders are small programs that lie on the GPU to be run whenever you attempt to render something. These shaders are written in a language called GLSL which resembles C quite a lot. And GLSL is specifically tailored to be used with graphics, and it contains a lot of useful features for linear algebra like vector and matrix manipulating. So here we have a very basic overview of the graphics pipeline in OpenGL. As we can see, the order of operation here is that our vertex data gets sent to the vertex shader. The vertex shader has one job really, which is to position the vertices on the screen. And then the fragment shader is run for every of these position vertices of the shape and also all the pixels in between all of the vertices of the shape, forming a sort of plane between all vertices. The fragment shader also really only has one job, and that is to set the color for each of these fragments, or rather pixels, on this kind of plane. And when that is done, the pixels should be rendered to your screen. Piece of cake, right? Well, perhaps not now, but this will become a lot easier the more you do it, since you'll understand what you can do with this, but even more important, what you have to do to actually make it work. And also quick note that there are actually a lot more shaders than these in the pipeline and they all have their own purpose, but we will not be using them in these tutorials. Let's go ahead and take a look at the vertex shader in our project from the last episode a little closer and try to understand what's going on. So the first row says version 330 core. This is just the version of OpenGL that we're using. In our display manager class, we specified that we wanted to use OpenGL 3.3 core profile, which is what this row means. The shader version should match the one that you chose for the OpenGL context exactly. Then we get to the layout rows. Here we just say that the first attribute list in our VAO is our vertex position data, and the second attribute list is the vertex color data. Then we've specified an out variable. This variable is passed along to the fragment shader. And in the fragment shader, we can't really use the layout keyword like we do here. Um, so to pass vertex data to the fragment shader, we usually do it this way by just supplying an output variable that passes along the value from the vertex data. Then we have the main function. This is the actual function or program that is run on the GPU. Here you can use loops, uh, if statements, whatever you feel like, as long as you make sure to do at least one thing. In the vertex shader, you have to set the geo position variable to a vector with four coordinates before it is done. Here in this shader, I've just set the geo position to be equal to the vertex position data from right here the eight position. Also a quick note on syntactic sugar in GLSL, you can extract any vector value from a vector using XYZW or RGBA in any order that you like. And when you instantiate new vectors, you can also choose to write, for example, a position dot XY, and then only have to write the Z and W coordinates. Pretty handy. Let's move on to the fragment shader. We also started with a version definition that should match your OpenGL version. And then we specify an output variable called frag color. The fragment shader doesn't have the same kind of variable for the output color like the vertex shader has for the vertex position, this geo position. So instead we have to create an output variable from the fragment shader that is of type vec4. And it should, at the end of the shader, contain the output RGBA color values of the specific fragment. Then we have our input variable vertex color. So this variable right here in our fragment shader and this one in the vertex shader are connected. The value from the vertex shader will be passed along to the fragment shader. It's super important that these are of the same type and have the same name, otherwise the variables won't be linked together to be able to pass values between them. So always make sure that they match exactly. Anyway, just like the vertex shader, we have a small main function in our fragment shader, which should perform something and last but definitely not least, eventually set the output fragment color. In this specific shader, we're just setting the fragment color to be equal to the vertex color data. Let's also take a look at the vertex data that we're feeding into our shaders and try to make sense of what's happening. So every row in this array is a vertex, and the first two numbers specify the position of the vertex, and the three last is the color in RGB. I'm skipping the alpha value and always setting it to one inside the shaders. So let's say that we are running our shaders and we are at the first vertex. Our variable a position would contain the values minus 0 0.5 and 0 0.5, and the a color variable would contain 100. 0, 0. 
The color values are pretty straightforward to what they mean. 100 would mean full red, no green, and no blue, so a completely red color. However, the values of minus 0.5 and 0.5 are perhaps not that straightforward. In OpenGL, we are working with something called normalized device coordinates. This basically means that the coordinate system for the screen is like this. We have the position 0, 0 in the middle of the screen, minus 1, minus 1 to the bottom left, and 1, 1 to the top right, and so on. If you've made games using other tools, you'll be familiar with that when we specify coordinates for things, 0, 0 is usually at the top left, and Y increases as we go down, and X increases as we go to the right. Well, that's not really the case when just using straight up vertex position data for our shaders and where to put them on the screen. We can, however, turn this coordinate system into a coordinate system that looks like the one that I just described. But that is for a future tutorial where I will construct a 2D camera that can pan around, zoom in and out, and all that good stuff. So now we know what these position values minus 0.5 and 0.5 actually mean, and since we are not modifying the VBO data in any way in our shaders, we're simply setting the GL position to the VBO position data, which means that the VBO positions will be interpreted as if they were normalized device coordinates. Using that coordinate system, we can see that the position minus 0.5 and 0.5 is halfway to the left and halfway up. We can of course do the same for all of the other vertices. Something important to note here is that I have separated the vertex data into two parts, three lines at the top and three lines at the bottom. These two parts both describe one triangle each, and that is usually what we want our vertex position data to describe. When we're rendering triangles, we want to have multiples of three vertices where these three together describe a triangle in a shape. So this video described two triangles and we got a rectangle out of it. You can, of course, pause the video and convince yourself that these two triangles create a rectangle and have two vertices each that they share and connect at. It might seem unnecessary to define two of our vertices twice, and there are, of course, ways to eliminate these kinds of things, but it's not our top priority to have maximum performance here unless we realize that we need it at some point. So now that we understand what the VBO data actually means, how it is being used in the shaders, and what the shaders are doing with this data, let's do some quick tidying up in this project. So start by making a new folder inside of our rendering folder, call it shaders. And inside this folder, create a new class called shader. In this class, we need two fields for the vertex and fragment shader GLSL code. So let's make a couple of strings for the vertex code and fragment code. Then we're also going to need the ID that this shader is going to be associated with, so let's make that. Now we can quickly create a constructor that takes in the two shader code strings, just like that. We need a method that loads our shader into OpenGL, creates the program and does linking and stuff. Then we'll make a smaller method which we'll call when we want to use this shader, so we'll just call it use. Inside the load method we want to do pretty much the exact same thing that we did in our test game class before. A nice way to do this is to just put the shader and test game classes side by side like this, and then we'll be able to see exactly what we did side by side. We create a couple of temporary variables for our vertex and fragment shaders. Then we create our vertex shader, add the code to it, and compile it. Also, don't forget to include the actual OpenGL bindings. We do the exact same thing for the fragment shader. We create it, add the code, and compile it. Then we continue with creating the program, attaching the shaders, and linking them. Now you can close the test game class and so we can focus on the shader class. Here's the first thing that we're going to do differently in this shader class. We're going to be deleting the vertex and fragment shader objects. This is because when a shader program has been created and linked, it is going to be able to be completely standalone. It does no longer need the vertex and fragment shader objects. So that means that we can delete them to free a bit of OpenGL memory, which is always good. So first we have to detach both shaders from the shader program and then we delete them. The second and last thing that we're going to change in this shader class is we're going to add the consideration of potential GLSL compilation errors. When we write our shaders, we want it to somehow tell us if we've written anything wrong or if we've missed a semicolon or whatever. We don't want the shader to just not work. And fortunately, this is pretty easy to add. First, we create a new integer array and call it status. This array status is going to be equal to GL get shader IV with a flag geo compile status, this OpenGL function will return whether or not the compilation succeeded. And if the status at index zero is equal to zero, then it failed to compile. And if it fails, we want to know what the error was. So we create a new string error, and it's gonna be equal to GL get shader info log. This will return a string that will contain the error message of the shader compilation. And then we could just call debug.writeline, and then we can see the error message in the output window in Visual Studio. Now all we have to do is copy paste this for the fragment shader as well, and then we're done. Now we go down to the other method called use, and it's as simple as saying gluseprogram of program ID. Now let's see if this shader actually works. 
Head back to the test game class and remove the shader ID at the top and exchange it for a shader, just like that. Then we go down to the load cotton method and remove everything that has to do with creating and loading our shaders, like that. We simply say shader is equal to a new shader with our vertex shader and fragment shader codes. And then all we have to do is shader.load. Down in the render method, we simply remove this GLUse program and exchange it for a call to shader.use. Let's start it to make sure it works. And sure enough, it does. A class like this is very useful in the sense that we'll have many different shaders in our project and having to do this manually for every shader becomes extremely tedious. So instead of doing that, we can just use this class where we input the code for each shaders and it does it automatically. Next time, we'll create a 2D camera object, which we'll be able to pan around with and zoom in and out. And the videos after the 2D camera will be about textures and how to render those using OpenGL. That is all for today. Thank you for watching.